Chapter 9 The Psychedelic Warlords Nick continued the drive to raise Hawkwind's profile. Not consciously, and certainly not calculatedly. But he was the accessible one, the band member who always seemed to be out among the people, visiting benefits and causes even when Hawkwind weren't playing, and offering the band services to the next event. Half the time, he didn't even ask the band what they thought. Accompanying the latest CND march? Sure. A release benefit? Of course. The success of their Wormwood Scrubs gig got around and they were invited to play a couple of other jails, Chelmsford, six years before the Sex Pistols made capital out of playing the same place, and Pentonville. It was enough that a cause seemed righteous, because that was why the band existed. Plus, it was his van that drove the band around, and his money that went into the petrol tank. Journalist Nick Kent captures the mood. A couple of years later, he would in the car as Nick, racing down the Autobahn en route to a gig at Berlin's Olympic Stadium, lost two wheels and came too close to killing the pair of them. We finally arrived at the gig on the back of a tow truck, Nick laughs. Right now, though, such trappings, and pitfalls, of fame were far removed from Hawkwind. No one at this juncture was in it for the money or nurturing any kind of fame-seeking agenda, Kent writes. If the group were offered the choice of playing for free in a field somewhere, or performing at a paying venue, they would almost always go for the cash-free option. Later, Nick discovered that even this early on, there were other forces in the band who positively loathed putting on the free shows, who wanted nothing more than to sign with the headline agency and get out there and play the theaters, proper tours to paying punters. Dave Brock let it be known that Clearwater management itself needed £200 a week just to keep going, and that right now, they were making no more than £140. He complained that his busking career, which apparently remained his main source of income, was sometimes reduced to one day a week, and he lashed out volubly against bands who seemed to be raking in the cash and giving very little in return for it. Free, for instance, with whom Hawkwind had recently played. They were getting something like £800 for doing a series of numbers that all sounded exactly the same, Brock declared, at a time when Hawkwind's standard rate was £70 a show, it would increase to £125 in the new year, and they rarely received even that. Now Brock was adamant that they would soon start collecting it, and from a simple logistic angle, he was correct. Not every cause that Nick agreed to aid was actually as deserving, or well organized, as he'd been led to believe. Not every venue that promised to pay them intended making good on its word. But Nick's argument was irrefutable. The day Hawkwind began saying no to the people who needed them was the day they stopped being the band they were. Philosophers and critics could talk about Ken Kesey and Timothy Leary, and experimenting with mind-altering, not drugs or not only drugs, but energies. But that's all it was, talk. Hawkwind were actually out there, targeting consciousness, raising it, running with it. Politics impinged but only in a general sense, in as much as political awareness was essential if your goal was to effect social change by changing social attitudes. But whereas the likes of the White Panthers and the Pink Fairies espoused burning down the establishment, Hawkwind dreamed of repossessing it. That said, Nick acknowledges, we did a lot of benefits for the Panthers around that time, playing with whoever. We played with The Sweet at One, and Asabisa and Audience, a jazz fusion band, and Graham Bond, at the Goldsmiths Art College in New Cross. Graham was a really nice guy, but he was another one who could change like the weather. He used to claim he was the illegitimate son of Aleister Crowley, and I think okay, then. I guess the drugs people take affects them. So, Nick pressed on with his vision of the band, and the ease with which things seemed to fall into place didn't surprise him in the slightest. The world needed Hawkwind. Fun City loomed. One of the crucial free festivals of the year, Fun City was a three-day event pieced together by the now ubiquitous Mick Farron, heavily promoted by pirate radio Geronimo, and headlined by the MC5. It was never originally intended to be free, 
that was decided upon only after funding for the event was withdrawn just a few days prior to the show. Faced with the choice of cancelling the entire affair or going ahead regardless, Farron contacted the bands that were scheduled to play, and gave them a straight alternative. They could either play for free, or they could pull out. Incredibly, most agreed to play. Aside from Hawkwind, there were performances from the Broughtons, Mungo Jerry, Free, Mighty Baby, Sonia Christina, The Humble Bums, featuring Gary Rafferty and Billy Connolly, Steve Peregrine Tux Chagrat, The Pink Fairies and poet William Burroughs. The Black Heath Foot and Death Men, described by Farron as an atavistically violent six-man team of Morris dancers composed of three Hells Angels, two sociopathic roadies and Pete Curry, our driver, made their bloody, bruising debut. All adding up to an event which the audience remember as magical, which Farron conceded was chaotic, and which a local public health officer named E.T. Oates condemned with unequivocal rage. The whole thing was offensive and obscene in many ways and you would have been surprised at some of the people there. There had been university people from America, Oxford, and Cambridge and ordinary decent people. They just wanted to do what they wanted to do and they did it. I just cannot understand it neither could David Bedford, at that time a member of Kevin Ayer's band. He recalled, it was an open-air concert called Fun Spelt in true 60s fashion Fun City, and the promoter disappeared halfway through the weekend. So in order not to hang around wasting time when there was no hope of being paid, we went on together with the Edgar Broughton band and played simultaneously. Since the Edgar Broughton band only had about two chords in all their songs, we were able to join in with them, but when it came to doing Kevin's songs, I had to scream out all the chord changes in the middle of playing to their bass player, and Rob Broughton stood next to Kevin who shouted out the chord changes to him, and both drummers just did what they could. It must have been a dreadful row for the audience. For Nick, the highlight of the weekend was the chance to see, and meet, the MC5. Three years out from their incendiary debut, the immolating clarion of Kick Out the Jams, the Motor City 5 remained the authentic voice of the rock revolution, long after all the other contenders, the American agitators of the late 1960s, had faded into either irrelevance or repetition. Far more than the dead, he would muse, the MC5 was the one band with whom he could genuinely see Hawkwind being compared not musically, necessarily, for the MC5's short sharp shocks had little in common with the Hawks' improvisations. But in terms of attitude, in terms of belief, and in terms of self-belief, the two bands were peas in a pod. I remember going down there and being so excited by the whole thing. I was even working on the gate some of the time, to help out, collecting money from people coming in, the people on the gate were friends of mine, people from Friends magazine, so I got involved with them. And then the MC5 played, and they were phenomenal. DJ Andy Dunkley agrees. What a great gig. Like a lot of those things, it developed into a free festival. Bands were going on stage for free and refusing to appear before the cameras, Radio Caroline were filming the event, and I remember when the MC5 came on, I was in the corner in my DJ booth and I heard Fred Smith turn to Rob Tyner and say man, this is gonna be a weird one. And it was. Nick was quick to introduce himself to the MC5, and when the Americans played another show back in London, out in Bayswater somewhere, I remember seeing them there and hanging around in the dressing room, doing what you do. We met up again in America a few years later, when I was doing a tour with Hawkwind. We were in Detroit, and I went to a nightclub with them, and we sat and chatted. I thought they were a really good band, the precursors of punk in America really, and Wayne Kramer was an excellent guitarist. And I saw John Sinclair the band's manager and mentor throughout their most crucial years more recently at the Inn on the Green, performing at the Boss Goodman Night. I played there with my band as well, the Nick Turner Band, we played a lot of jazzy stuff, and John was doing some solo performing, playing guitar and singing. Another night, Hawkwind opened for Arthur Lee and Love, whose performance reminded Nick just how much he used to love the band's Forever Changes LP. I got the albums from my friend Tony Cooper, 
a brilliant flute and sax player who was emigrating to USA when I lived in Margate. Then the album got stolen, and I heard it again in the car of my girlfriend Stilt Ska West, ex Deb Society Dame, on my way to Daddy's Flying Saucer. Following the show, staged inevitably at the Roundhouse, Nick accompanied the headliners down to the speakeasy, where they jammed the night away. Cool scene. On December 13, 1970, Hawkwind were back at the Roundhouse, to co-headline the venue's Christmas party with the ferries. The Roundhouse itself was a disused railway building that had once housed one of the immense turntables that are used to turn locomotives around. But it had stood derelict for much of its century-long life, only to be reborn initially by Arnold Wesker, as Center 42, the People's Theatre, and in 1967 as the home to a host of happenings, the birthplace of British space rock, and a lot more besides. The interior of the roundhouse had scarcely changed in the past three years. The electricity supply was still little more than any domestic dwelling might require, the seating arrangements were still rickety and primitive, and the cloying stench of ancient diesel oil still cut through the breath of modern incense and dope. But the roundhouse belonged to the underground, and it retained its place in their hearts, long after the underground emerged into daylight. In 1978, Nick and Barney Bubbles even recreated a genuine 60s love-in, Nick Turner's bohemian love-in with his own new band, SPHYNX, soon to become Inner City Unit. Dancers, light shows, and a host of up-and-coming post-punk psychedelics passed across the sacred stage, and all who were there that night remember the event with affection. The 1970s show, which also featured an acoustic set from Steve Peregrine took, once one half of Tyrannosaurus Rex, but now a mere bystander as his erstwhile partner, Mark Bolan, soared towards superstardom, epitomized the original spirit of the roundhouse shows. The cost of hiring the hall ensured that admission would have to be charged, but there was compensation in the form of free food and acid and two lengthy sets from the headlining bands. Profits from the show, incidentally, were split between the Roundhouse and sundry underground allies the International Times and Friends and the like. And so successful was the event, and so well did Hawkwind go down, that they now became all but a Roundhouse fixture, not only as performers, they also became regulars at the Sisters Club in Tottenham, spiritually a mini roundhouse, operated by the IT slash Friends Axis, but also as audience members. Nick certainly headed down there at every opportunity he could, and it was there that he bumped into Robert Calvert, who I probably hadn't seen in a year or so. I think he might have been away again. Calvert was now a regular performer in his own right, a sci-fi freak whose performances, usually alongside a young spacey French band he knew, already incorporated many of the themes that Hawkwind, through their music at least, were themselves striving towards. When I moved to London, Calvert recalled, I had an exhibition of environmental poetry at the Roundhouse Better Place to live exhibition. I got involved with the underground as soon as I came to London. I looked on myself as a kind of anti-literary establishment guerrilla. I hated the weak impact of straight poetry, and realized that the only way to get through to people is through music. A union between the two seemed inevitable, particularly after Nick described Hawkwind's sound to Calvert. It struck me as being the perfect description of the music I myself was playing at the time, Calvert later explained. Hitherto, he admitted, I assumed that Hawkwind were just another heavy rock band. Now he was so enthused by what he saw and sensed that, even before he knew what purpose it might serve, he set to work writing a Hawkwind log book, a sci-fi journal of poetry and prose discovered, it was claimed, by Captain R. N. Calvert of the Societe Astronome on July 8, 1971 in the vicinity of Mare Librium near the South Pole. The discovery of the Hawkwind has led to more wild speculation than any of the mysteries of space that we have so far encountered. The facts surrounding the discovery of this drifting two-dimensional spaceship have been so distorted by guesswork and rumor that any further attempts at assessment would only increase the density of the fog. The following extracts from the ship's log are presented without commentary, for the reader to form his own conclusions. They would appear to be the work of a collective robo-scribe, 
although one or two of the entries might possibly have been made by the hand of a single unassisted crew member whose identity still remains unknown. We hope this amazing document will stimulate scientists, mystics, occultists, policemen, and all children everywhere. What followed would become the closest Hawkwind ever came towards a musical manifesto, elements of which still cling to them today but which, at that time, defined Hawkwind in the public mind at a time when definition was the one thing their music had never applied itself to. Poetry familiar from the live show can be sourced through the pages of the Hawkwind log, and though Calvert's official enrollment into Hawkwind was still to be ratified, he nevertheless became a part of the floating anarchy that surrounded the group's membership and anarchy, incidentally, that applied to every musician who now came into the group. For whatever reason, only the founding members of the band were required to add their signatures to either the Liberty Records contract, or the subsequent paperwork that surrounded their transfer to the parent United Artists. There, the five founders were recognized as the legal owners of the Hawkwind name, and the legal representatives of its promulgation, a democratic notion that manager Doug Smith once told Nick had been designed very deliberately. His dream, he said, was for Hawkwind to become not a single, solitary entity, but a floating cooperative of musicians and players, with any one of the original band members stepping out with his own unique version of Hawkwind. It was, sadly, a dream that one member of that primal quintet would have serious objections to. The look of the band was changing again. Tiring of the road, and looking for a more settled existence on the organizational side of the music industry, Tom Crimble departed swiftly to be replaced by Dave Anderson, until recently a member of the Krautrocking Amendool too. I'd seen Dave playing in Berlin with Amendool, says Nick, and again with Edgar Froese, in Commune 1, and one day we just met in the United Artists Record Company, so I invited him to join the band. Dick Mick, too, wandered off, seriously shaken after an accident on the way to Aviemore Ski Center to rehearse Hawkwind's new album. Traveling with the road crew, they were struck by another car whose driver was instantly beheaded by the impact. John the Dump, one of Hawkwind's roadies, had his arm crushed beneath the band's overturned truck. Dick Mick could not face the prospect of forever traveling British roads any longer. He had never lost his old ambition of journeying to India. Now was the time. Road manager Dal Didmar, another of the passengers in the accident, would replace him, then remain on board if and when Dick Mick ever returned. Perhaps the most significant addition of all, however, was not a musician at all. It was a dancer. Hawkwind had long ago grown accustomed to particularly out of it members of the audience joining them on stage, freak dancing until either they fell off or were escorted off. Not many of them, though, asked permission beforehand. Stephanie Leach Stacia to her friends did. She first saw Hawkwind at the Isle of Wight, and remembered the cat with the silver face trying to chat her up. Unsuccessfully. When she saw that they had a show scheduled in her own neck of the woods, at a festival alongside St. Michael's Mount in Cornwall, there she was again. She asked if she could dance on stage, Nick told her she'd have to remove her clothes first. Stacia promptly stripped and, afterwards, announced to all in earshot, that was wonderful. That's the most free I've ever been. Nick asked her if she'd like to do it again, and offered to come and pick her up from work the next day and take her to the show. Stacia agreed and, when the band arrived at the petrol station where she worked, it was to discover that she had already handed in her notice. She leaped aboard the van and, whenever Hawkwind played around her hometown of Exeter, or further afield across Devon and Cornwall, she'd be there for the encore. Soon, Stacia was traveling further afield either with the band or under her own steam, appearing on stage at most Hawkwind shows, and then appearing at all of them. She even received her own share of the money, on the occasions that there was any to share. Which, as 1971 progressed, was more than ever before. Chapter 10 Children of the Sun the exposure the band gained at the Isle of Wight was really making a difference now. Suddenly, Hawkwind were more likely than not to at least pick up a few quid extra apiece at the end of a show usually no more than a fiver, 
but compared to before, that was a fortune. Indeed, Tom Crimble nailed the precarious finances that beset most bands of the era when he looked back on his days with Skin Alley and recalled being lucky to have two shillings and sixpence a day, twelve and a half pence, the cost of a fry up at the Mountain Grill Cafe in Notting Hill to live on. Gear was falling into place. Nick had a Selmer 100 watt speaker cabinet, and a revolving selection of borrowed amps, among them, a Vox bass amp, a Marshall 50 or a high watt 100. Brock played through his 100 watt high watt stacks, Crimble through a 100 watt Marshall. Venues that once turned Hawkwind away were now calling Clearwater to ask if they could book the band it was funny how getting their names in the paper suddenly made their music sound less progressive, Nick mused, but he held no grudges. Some weeks, Hawkwind were playing six nights out of seven, and while they still weren't in a position to pick and choose between shows and venues, were still manhandling the yellow ward from one end of the country to the other, and then back again according to the whim of their convoluted schedule, it was clear that something was happening. Increasingly, there a sense that every time they played, they drew a few hundred more people into the camp, a few new friends into their world. They hit the university circuit in earnest, and the once uptight bookers bent backwards to appeal to the band, eschewing the dark halls that staged their usual shows and erecting makeshift stages outside on the campus, setting up some lights and recreating a festival setting for the ultimate festival band. Others would go even further, paying the band out of student union funds, but allowing the audience in for free. Personally, Nick admitted that he was surprised that Hawkwind had got so far as they had. He was never convinced that Hawkwind's music would appeal to anybody, simply because they never pandered to public taste, never compromised, and just played exactly what we wanted. By a happy accident, though, people seemed to dig it. Still he had no expectations, never lay around dreaming that the band would become successful. It was just rewarding that it was as popular as it was, and that they were able to turn people on like that that people were so receptive to it. Yet the reasons for that weren't hard to determine. Hawkwind, IT noted approvingly, are a community band, strongly rooted in the freak subculture of Ladbroke Grove and Notting Hill, then spreading the message out from there. They provided, the paper continued, some alternative to the vast numbers of irrelevant, uncommitted rock bands. Stacia, no matter how certain, predominantly male, members of the audience saw her, was a large part of this commitment. Other bands had hired onstage dancers before, the Velvet Underground recruited a couple from the Warhol Circus when they were first gigging out, and of course David Bowie would soon be walking those same paths as well. But always in the past, and in the future too, the dancers felt like a sideshow, something going on elsewhere on the stage for when the audience got bored watching the musicians. Stacia was different. She felt like a member of the band, and if it's cheap and cliché to say that her body itself became an instrument, that doesn't mean it's less true. She led the band in other directions, too. Though she would always be remembered as Hawkwind's naked dancer, she began creating her own costumes, grandiose spectacles that first rivaled, and then encouraged Nick's moves in a similar direction. Body paint adorned the parts that her costumes didn't cover, and her movements embraced every emotion she felt, again, a certain kind of male audience was prone in those days to greet any onstage female with a chorus of get your kid off. Faced with a dancer who may have already done that, it was astonishing how many unreconstructed Neanderthals actually found themselves concentrating on other aspects of the performance instead. And Nick, sensing that shift, realized that Hawkwind needed to cater to those new expectations. Maybe not blatantly, definitely not choreographed, and certainly not premeditated. Regardless, there always seemed to be something going on on stage, something to look at, whether it was Stacia and Nick predicting the glam rock theatricality that was still edging towards the mainstream's attention, and was the antithesis of everything that Hawkwind seemed to stand for, or Del Didmar grinning hobgoblin-like from behind a growing, and increasingly eccentric battery of homemade electronica, Brock hunched and studious, conjuring alchemy from his guitar, Anderson and Alice locked. In syncopated single-mindedness. 
amps and equipment exploding in color and design, courtesy of Barney Bubbles. Serious rock fans, the people who bought Elp records because every chord seemed to arrive with its own self-important fanfare, or Zeppelin, because Jimmy Page played guitar as though he got paid for every note he strummed, they looked down their noses at Hawkwind, dismissed them as a bunch of hippies who couldn't write a good tune if you played it for them first. Music fans have always been prey to frightful snobbery, and every person's favorite band is superior to someone else's. But there was something about Hawkwind that seriously divided the gig-going public, a gulf that yawned between the virtuosity of the Purples, Eeps and Jethro Tulls, and the primal scream of a band that simply took the stage, plugged in and roared. Now, as the band ventured deeper into the realms of a full multimedia presentation, adding light shows and slides to their onstage arsenal, there was another division forming, the gulf between bands that demanded their audience spectate, and even requested that people refrain from applause until the performance was over, yes, it did happen, and those that set out to blur the distinction between stage and dance floor altogether, to create an experience so immersive that even unmoving non. Musicians at the back of the room could walk away feeling as though they had contributed something to the proceedings. Nick details the changing stage show. I always liked that theatrical aspect of performing, even early on when I started off in dirty old jeans with holes in them and a leather jacket. I thought it was street cred, I wanted to perform how I really, was so I'd wear the clothes that I wore on the street. That developed into the frog costume with the advent of Stacia. I became a bit more theatrical, until during the space ritual, I started to do these balletic moves with Stacia, who was wearing a tutu. Stacia and I were always encouraging one another, and egging each other on. She was always very much a would-be ballet dancer, despite being too big, but she got herself a tutu and I went along with it and played the male part of a ballet duet, Frog Lake. It was all very spontaneous, but it worked out interestingly because it was quite wild and expressionistic. Or other times, she would be naked, with the body paint on. But it was never highlighted, it was just a part of the show, which is why I think a lot of people missed it. Besides, Stacia was not the only member of the band who would often appear on stage without clothing. Terry Alice, too, was known to disrobe if the stage got too hot or he felt in the mood, and apparently he even wound up in one of the Sunday newspapers as a consequence. Even better, though, was the night Hawkwind played a debutante's ball, one where the dressing room was situated at the opposite end of the dance floor to the stage. Traversing that in the altogether, Alice gave the girls something more than an eyeful. Back in the world of the purposeful performance, Nick and Stasha's own theatrical instincts were not misplaced. Glamrock was only just around the corner now, in March, 1971, Mark Bolan appeared on top of the Pops wearing makeup for the first time, Slade were preparing for their costume breakthrough, the sweet, David Bowie and Gary Glitter were eyeing the makeup counters in readiness for their own glam slams the following year. A full nine months ahead of that trio, and with a theatrical vivaciousness that made Bolan look threadbare, Nick and Stacia were blazing a costume path that was without precedent. Nick laughs. I remember I used to look at David Bowie and see all the things he's done and I'd think well, I've done a lot of that, too but nobody was ever there to give me any publicity about it, plus, Hawkwind were the least glam rock band in the world. Stacia got a bit of attention because she wore these way out costumes, and photographers did try and capture her although there was usually so much dry ice swirling around, and our light show was growing so vivid that even she didn't get photographed as much as she should have. But the rest of the band looked like they were in another group entirely. So I tried to make it a bit more interesting, his frog costume, for which he is probably remembered better than any other visual imagery he premiered during these years, was partly inspired by Gong, I used to go and see them a lot, and they were also into costuming a little. It was just an idea based around a mask that I bought somewhere, and then I picked up a body stocking that matched the mask. I painted them up with UV paint, with an Egyptian eye of Horus, and then I got Barney to decorate the body stocking in a form inspired a little by Eternity from the Doctor Strange comics. 
Eternity was the whole cosmos and the Milky Way rolled into one, so I got Barney to paint all these cosmic images, with moons and stars and cosmic spiral galaxies and stuff like that. And then I devised this whole scenario, people used to give me stuff all the time, so I had some sort of robe that looked like it was worn by a bishop, which gave me the idea of turning my frog suit into a bishop's suit, this cassock thing with the big cross on it and other bits and pieces, then I took the frog's head and put it on top of my head like a bishop's mitre. I'd come on stage, blessing the audience, then turning to my equipment and miming opening it and making this sort of metamorphosis into a frog, before going out and dancing with Stacia. It was all very allegorical and symbolic, but without telling people what was happening. Plus, I think a lot of the people who saw it were under the influence of psychedelic drugs, so they had their own vision of what was going on and a dancing frog slash bishop would probably have made perfect sense. I never elaborated on what I did by stating what I was intending to do, while I also had a constant struggle with actually being seen. I never got lit properly, so people couldn't tell what I was doing, half the time. It was all very sporadic. We had a road manager, John the Bog, who wanted Jonathan Smeaton to light me properly, but it never happened, Liquid Len were never going to focus on me for whatever reason, and I was never so egotistical that I wanted to insist on it. So I let it go, and just got on with portraying whatever it was I was portraying to people who wondered what the fuck was going on. For the most part, and Stacia, of course, notwithstanding, Nick's bandmates were often as bemused as the audience, rarely even offering up an opinion one way or the other. Lemmy thought it was quite amusing after he joined, but I was probably seen as a performing fool that was an asset to the band, although nobody understood why. His taste for the bizarre was not always as safe as it might have been, however. One night, performing at a gay liberation benefit, Nick took the stage wearing a metal shirt, made with gold thread. I had my saxophone plugged into the amplifier, and we were about to get started. I walked across to the microphone, said, hello, and suddenly there was a huge explosion and I was knocked over backwards. I hit the speaker cabinets and they fell all over me. The microphone was still in my hand, stuck to it with the power full on. All of 10 million volts were going through me, and all I could see was a huge, blue, continuous flashing that I was in the middle of. I could hear these voices in the background, turn the fucking power off, and everybody was panicking. But no one did anything about it. I could hear my heart beating and it was going be dumb, be, dumb, be, dumb getting slower and slower. I thought Christ, I am going to die in a minute. It was like being locked inside a magnet. I was paralyzed. I wanted to get the microphone out of my hand, but I couldn't coordinate my arms. Then suddenly, the power went off, after what seemed to be about half an hour, though it was probably only about 30 seconds. It felt like a long, long time. Fortunately for me, I think, I had taken a large amount of acid before it happened, and that kept me detached enough to stay calm. When the power went off they were saying C.O.R., thank goodness you're alright, and I was saying why shouldn't I be? There's nothing wrong with me. But we thought you were dead. I thought there was nothing wrong with me until I looked down at my hand and there was this huge fucking hole in it, I've still got the scar, where the microphone had stuck. It had burnt its way through my hand, all my fingertips were burnt too. I had a thorough degree burn, right inside the flesh. When I came out of the hospital, I felt fine, so I went back to the gig, got on stage and finished the set with this huge bandage. After that little affair I liked electricity. I remember one day I was fixing a light socket in my house and I accidentally stuck my fingers into the hole. It felt great. Another time, experimenting with some on-stage fire eating, he succeeded only in igniting his arm. However, he was not to dwell in the theatrical wilderness for long. As Robert Calvert became more and more a part of the lineup, graduating from occasionally walking on to perform a poem, to taking an active role in the entire performance, so he quickly followed Nick's lead. 
I do think it inspired Robert to start wearing weird things on stage. He used to dress up as Lawrence of Arabia, or a fighter pilot, or he'd come out with a submachine gun on stage that he was firing off blanks with. Of course, the frog suit was not without its occasional drawbacks. It was not easy to see out of the mask, and the costume itself was scarcely an all-weather design. As Nick discovered during an open-air gig in Harlow, he and Mike Moorcock were late arriving at the venue, having been out having a meal, and walking around beforehand. They got there in the nick of time, and while Moorcock followed the rest of the band out onto the stage, and launched into his opening poem, Nick threw himself into his frog suit, then raced out onto the stage, unaware that for whatever reason, disturbances in the pool in front of the stage, perhaps, or maybe a passing rain shower, the stage itself was very wet, and very slippery. On he came, and straight off again, sliding across the stage and over the edge, straight into the pool. Which, he admits, was quite appropriate, really. But he climbed out, back onto the stage, and I did the show dripping wet, trying to pretend that nothing had happened. Soon, Nick was a regular customer at a London theatrical costumier's, either renting or purchasing outfits for upcoming shows. Fondly he remembers a Knight's Templar costume, replete with helmet and chain mail, less affectionately, he recalls the time he decided to become a fully space-suited astronaut. It was at the Hammersmith Odeon. The rest of the band went on stage, and I was supposed to be making my grand entrance, and instead, I got lost underneath the stage in all these tunnels. I took a wrong turning somewhere amongst all these tunnels, and I suppose there's an area where there might have been a trap door, but I didn't find it. It took what felt like eons to finally get myself back on the stage. Years later, Spinal Tap would make a movie filled with things like that.